and welcome to HP 101 session 4, uh, what we believe here at High Point. Uh, we're going to look at uh, a Bible, God, humanity, and salvation uh, during this session, right? So first, let's look at uh, uh, the Bible, right? So uh, we believe in 66 books of the Bible. The Bible contains uh, two parts. One is the Old Testament and the second is New Testament. And you can follow some of these things on page number 19 uh, in the book that has been provided to you. Uh, so, <clears throat> well, uh, Old Testament uh, is uh, uh, the same book as Jewish Old Testament, which is accepted as uh, inspired, divinely inspired book. So that's what, in fact, Catholics have what? Uh, 46 uh, books in the Old Testament. Uh, but we have 39, right? That's what uh, we believe. So uh, we believe that the Word of God is inspired and inerrant. It never goes wrong. That's what we believe here. And what about New Testament? Uh, um, we believe that 27 books were carefully chosen and considered divinely inspired. You know, the canon, uh, the system of canon that uh, happened in uh, 397 AD, right? So they actually used three main standards to make sure they chose uh, the books of the New Testament. There are 27 of them. In fact, there were several gospels during that time, not just four that we see in the in the in the Bible, right? So they have uh, worked on three main standards. Of course, there are other main standards, but three main standards they looked for. First one is conformity between the doctrine and Christian truth recognized as normative in churches. That's the first standard, uh, you know, to choose uh, a book uh, of the New Testament to be circulated as divinely inspired, right? So the second standard is that that document should be written by apostles or indirect apostles, means those who were in immediate contact with them. So that has to be written by eyewitnesses or those who were in contact with eyewitnesses. And the third standard is that it should be widespread and should have a continuous acceptance and usage by the churches. So that is the standard that they used in order to choose uh, the books of the New Testament, right? And look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, and we also thank God continuously because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as, as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Look at that. That means when this word has been presented to people through Apostle Paul or disciples, no one actually opposed it but they could see the power of God in the word that has been presented to them, right? So you, you, this also talks about the standard that we are actually talking about when they chose the books of the Bible. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, we see all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see that? So this is what we, we believe here at High Point. All scripture is what God breathed. Otherwise it would not have sustained for this many years, almost 2000 years, right? So it has sustained not just in the culture it was born, but in the culture it has been transferred to. Anywhere it went, it has gone with power. And even like we are studying the book of Luke uh, uh, in, during these uh, sermon series, and you know how uh, Gospel of Matthew and Gospel of uh, John, Gospel of Luke, the, you know, they, they don't differ from each other, they don't contrast, they complement each other, but they actually give more explanation uh, relevant to different cultures. For example, Matthew is trying to present Jesus as uh, uh, the king of Jews, right? Or the king himself, the kingdom aspect he highlights. 
Whereas Luke presents Jesus as the savior of the world, savior of humanity. And John presents Jesus as the son of God. So you can you could see how uh, this has this inspirational aspect that could be relevant to every culture, right? Well, uh, what does this mean for us as Christians? So here is a quote from Michael Lawrence, who is a pastor of a uh, Baptist church in Oregon. And he says, God has spoken through his written word. In his word, he has revealed who he is, who we are, and how we call humanity generally and his people specifically to live. Non-Christians are saved and Christians grow in grace through the preaching, teaching, counseling, and speaking of God's word applied by God's spirit. This is what it means to us, right? So sometimes God's word should be seen as bread of life. How are we fed, right? So that is what uh, the uniqueness of High Point Church here is. When people come to this church, they are not just coming here, uh, you know, just to take a, a break from the week. They're coming so that they could be fed with the word of God. So that is what the Bible we believe in. Because the Bible is inspirational, it is inherent, and it has life so that we rely on the scriptures. All right? So now here is a question. How has scripture impacted your life? Have you actually uh, developed a plan of reading the scriptures or uh, did someone ever introduce you to the plan of reading the Bible from January to December, like three chapters a day so that you could finish cover to cover uh, by the end of the year? Yeah, so if you, if you start on January 1st with three chapters uh, from the book of Genesis, and by December, you'll finish the whole book. In fact, I'll tell you, like, I read uh, uh, the Bible from cover to cover seven times. And every time I read, I feel like I haven't read this before. It, it, it doesn't mean that uh, I forget what I read. It means that God reveals different, different things from the scriptures. It has life, right? So, any, any, any stories to this question, to add to it? How has scripture impacted your life? Yeah. It helped me handle situations better. Um, I've gone through some pretty difficult situations and um, by reading scripture instead of Responding with my flesh, I could respond in a more godly manner. Wow, that's beautiful. I had the same experience too. Several times, uh, it is the scripture that actually tells, oh, yeah, you, you need to respond it differently. <laughs> you know? Yeah, excellent. Let's move on. Now let's look at uh, what we believe about God here at High Point, right? <coughs> and you know, we are monotheistic than pluralistic uh, in approach. When I say that, there are churches in the world uh, which believe in the multiple gods and pluralism, or, well, there is a truth elsewhere, also that kind of churches. But here at High Point, we believe God is one, right? So we believe Trinity uh, in its essence. So uh, let's look at uh, uh, Psalms 83, 18. Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. So that's what we believe, the priority is God. Today's sermon is so relevant. How many of you went to the first service? All of you, right? So it's awesome, he was telling us, until we recognize God as he is, we will continue to play this kind of testing, kind of be equal God with us, or we don't feel he's above us, so we kind of use our rationale uh, to understand God, which will never work. Sometimes we have to acknowledge him first as God and sovereign and supreme, right? So now here is a, a reference from Deuteronomy. Uh, oh, it hasn't changed. Yeah, <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. That's a wrong reference there. We tried to fix it, but it didn't work. And this is actually Shema. 
Shema is a, a, called a Jewish prayer. They have recited, and we we still uh, follow that, uh, you know, kind of uh, assuring that it says, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord, or Lord, Lord God, what is Lord or God? The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength." This is a Shema prayer. They have recited. They have to keep this up front for Jewish people, right? The Lord is one. So what you do? You have to love your God with all your soul, with all your heart, and with all your strength. Do you remember Jesus has quoted this in the New Testament? And when he quoted, he added one more thing to that list. Do you know that? Mind. Mind. So we even use our mind, our intellectual capacity to understand. That is what even God is stepping out to make a sense of his presence, right? Well, God the Trinity. God exists in one essence as three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who are equal in their divine perfections and harmonious in the execution of their offices. And Trinity is actually a big subject. Uh, unless we dwell so deeper into that, uh, we don't get it. But it's kind of one God operates in three offices. They are so harmonious. Well, we, we, we sometimes take this order like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? But even Jesus was there at the beginning of creation, right? And then what about Holy Spirit? Bible tells in the beginning, was God and the Spirit of God was hovering all the waters. The Spirit was there long before, so they were all there from the beginning. So, but it's not really kind of order. This is first, this is second, and all. But God has revealed in an orderly way so that we can get it, right? So that is what it's all about, Trinity. And you can see here in Second Corinthians uh, chapter 13, <coughs> verse 14, we see the Apostle Paul's benediction to the. Corinthian believers and he says may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all you see the Trinity aspect when we are actually thinking of God we're not just saying one aspect of God we are actually including you know Holy Spirit and Jesus that's why when we say uh, 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 amen at the end we are actually pronouncing in the name of Jesus Right? In, in between, we ask the Spirit to work in us and we intercede to God. Right? So this is uh, about the Trinity that Paul was kind of uh, uh, using in his benediction when he was addressing to the Corinthian believers. Uh, here is actually uh, Tim Keller's uh, quote. Uh, it says, Christianity alone among the world faiths teaches that God is triune. The doctrine of the Trinity is that God is one being who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinity means that God is, in essence, relational. I agree with the last part, but the first part I have a little difficulty because uh, even in other world religions there is a Trinity. Uh, like Hinduism, they have a Trinity too, Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara. So uh, Tim is right in emphasizing that we have a different kind of meaning attached to our Trinity than the Trinity that Hinduism kind of advocates, right? You know, even in Taoism, you know, they have this kind of Trinity aspect, but uh, they are kind of different from what we believe. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Are in, in Hinduism, is it three? Do they look at it as three separate gods? Or is it look look at it as one similar one, one and three per, okay one okay but they they also have three different uh, distinct offices okay they do okay just like us only thing is the way we articulate sometimes the trinity that in other religion that we look at seems different for us because we have a different worldview mm -hmm. so we look at a different worldview perhaps the worldview that we have from 
Christian point of view. That is the view that we look at other uh, Trinity aspects. That's why we think that is totally different. But you know, if they explain, they think ours is different. But when you match together uh, in a comparative study, yeah, they, what they're saying is true, but culturally they're different. But anyway, our Trinity is something unique because it works in a relational thing, right? So we're going to look at that. In creation and new creation, we see the Father speaking through the Son by the power of the Spirit. Right? What is the creation and new creation that we're talking about? In the creation that we talk about, and even the new creation that God has created, and even the creation that we are in Jesus Christ. Right? So even if it is the old creation that has uh, to do with our old life, and the new life, or even the creation. So you take the whole thing, you see that Father speaking through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see a trinity involved in this. Think about uh, uh, the work of the Spirit in non-believers. Do you think that the work of the Spirit is there in non-believers? Yeah, Holy Spirit works in them too. When you go and witness to them, who convicts them? It's the Holy Spirit, not us, right? So who protects them, although they don't believe in true God? It is God himself, right? So who sacrificed for the sins of those non-Christians? It's Jesus, right? He died long before we accepted him, right? While we were sinners, he died on the cross. So it's a trinity is at work in, in relation with each other uh, to save mankind. All right, so let's move on to John chapter 17, verse 4. And here Jesus <coughs> says to the Father, what does he say? I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave to me. Who is telling this? Jesus telling to the Father, right? Jesus telling them, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. See, because on those days also, there was this distinction uh, during the time of Jesus. Oh, well, you know, which is God? Today also, have you heard about Jesus movement? Jesus only movement? Right? They highlight only Jesus, not God or Holy Spirit. Some of those things were there during that time too. Even John the Baptist was kind of uh, competed with Jesus baptism you know during that time the groups religious groups so here actually Jesus was showing through his prayer and through his relationship with God he actually telling I have brought you glory on earth when he prayed he shown the relationship the dependence upon each other that's talking about the unity and relationship between uh, the three persons in the Trinity right John 16 verse 4 we see he the Spirit will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. So now here, Jesus is talking about the Spirit that he was promising his disciples that I will send a Spirit after I have gone so that he will be comfortable, uh, you know, he, he will comfort you. And then he says, he will glorify me because it is from me that he will uh, receive what he will make known to you. So that's again relationship on Trinity. And Luke chapter, it's not Luke again, Matthew chapter 3 verse 17. We tried to fix it but it didn't work. We will change that. And here we see that as soon as Jesus was baptized and came onto the shore and while he was praying and a voice came from above and said, this is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. This is what? The Spirit affirming the action of Trinity from the beginning. That God uh, sending his son Jesus and Jesus sending Holy Spirit. In fact, this talks about uh, the mission of God. I, I don't know whether you are aware of the, uh, the idea, Monsieur Day. Monsieur Day means mission of God. In fact, the missionary concept today we see is not evolved out of just Jesus' great commission. 
but in fact it has started from the beginning god himself god sending jesus that itself is a missionary action sending from god then jesus sending holy spirit and then jesus sending all of us into the world to reach out right that's a genetic uh, relation right let's move on matthew chapter uh, 12 32 it says anyone who speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven but anyone who speaks against the holy spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come you look at how uh, they affirm each other that's the truth we're talking about god the trinity so we can't just undermine the spirit when we emphasize so much on god and jesus and here it says spirit works in every aspect he has been at work in the old testament and even in the new testament right so here it says anything that you sin against including son of man or god will be forgiven but sinning against the holy spirit will not be forgiven right now let's ask this question what comforts are available to the christian due to the fact that god is trinity what comforts are available i think relationship is the key to the trinity right what other aspects come to you Yes, the yeah. fact that the Holy Spirit resides in you and can give you direction and uh, wisdom and guidance and you know that that you are not facing things on your own so that's definitely comforting fact. it's comforting fact absolutely any other even I do have that there are times I have moments of discouragement and but I see a, a blanket of comfort the Holy Spirit residing in us you know, Bible says he grieves in us, you know, when we go through certain things. So that's great comfort. Any anything else? Let's move on then. Let's talk about humanity. Okay. So we are created by God for what purpose? This is actually basic, but uh, if we speak depth, but at the end we'll take questions in case you have. So, what is the purpose of uh, uh, human creation here? And if you look at Westminster Catechism, that tells that to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Right? So, why are we on earth existing? To glorify God. And of course, we enjoy ourselves, enjoy the creation that God has given us, and we enjoy Him forever. It's not that we are made slaves to God, but enjoy. It's a joy and enjoy. So we go back to him, right? And he created us male and female, right? So that we maintain what? Purity and reflect his holiness in creation. So that is the key of creating us male and female and I, I know there are so many things in the west like lgbtq right uh, the issues that come up in this society uh, but uh, again uh, the gender that god has created in human being is to maintain purity and reflect his holiness question how would you explain to a non-christian why it is important for a human being to maintain the sexual identity they are born with this is a question for uh, the west in fact uh, because of the cultural things that are growing up in this country right so how how would you explain to a non-christian why is it important for a human being to maintain sexual identity they were born with because sometimes there are people who are born that way it's not their problem. It's not that they can choose anything. Right? Yeah. God chose for you. God created you with a specific plan for you. When he created you, he created you to be male or female, whichever one you were born to be. And he didn't make a mistake. He designed you 
even if they are not male and female. What do you mean? I mean, some people are not born either male or female. <coughs> but the, if you do DNA testing, there is one. One or the other? They do oh. go one towards one or the other. Oh, okay. So you, you still, you know, people are born with deformities, but in, when you, you know, have a child that appears to have both or neither, then you do DNA testing to confirm which sex the child should be. That's a great answer. Yes. That's a great answer. Any other thoughts on that? But who we are is in our DNA. Oh, okay. And God gave us our DNA. So you are saying DNA has only two things, like male or female, right? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know that until you told me. Okay. Well, and I think that there are situations, too, where people can be attracted to the same sex, but whether they choose to engage upon that and follow that, it's whether they're putting their desires over their values or beliefs. So, um, yeah, I know someone, uh, a good friend who, uh, he struggles with same gender attraction, but he chose to get married, have kids. Like, you know, and he, his wife knows he struggles with it, and it's, um, that it's choosing to put biblical beliefs and values over just the straight up desires that he feels, if that makes sense. How would we do it to non-Christian who has no idea of what the Bible is? No, without about? offending them, I don't know. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, you can tell them about what the Bible says, and then you can also, um, I don't know your name. Laura. Laura. You know, as Laura said, you can have gender attraction just as you can have um, propensity towards alcoholism or towards drink, drinking a lot of alcohol. You can have a desire. I mean, everybody tends to have a desire towards something. But you can choose to give into that or you can choose to say no to it. Now, it's not necessarily easy to say no. In fact, most of the time it's not. Mm. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a choice. Mm. We always have a choice. And today in our society, we're being told that there are certain things we don't have a choice. Mm. Or that certain things are a disease. Mm. And I don't agree that alcoholism is a disease. Right, I don't right. believe that alcoholism is a result of many poor choices. Absolutely. And that you can become sober as a result of many choices. Because you don't recover from it by a prescription mm -hmm. or um, by some, I don't know, like going to the doctor, you know. You, you need to make good choices in order to recover from it. So it's all about choices. And something that's about choices is not a disease. A disease is something that needs to be dealt with medically. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, gender issue, if it is mentally based, understanding of their own identity, it could be categorized in some, some, some sort of uh, physical struggle, like you said, you know, mm -hmm. they make choice or they need help with. Mm -hmm. There may be some people who are born with deformities, which is not their own problem, right? So, yeah, good. Any other thing to add to it? Or we can move on. Let's look at uh, the fall and the redemption in the scriptures. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to, 7, 12 to 15. And of course, we're going to read a few more verses after that. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin 
by breaking, what is that? Did I miss that? Uh, by breaking command as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. So what, um, what it implies to us? Any thoughts on this verse? And let's look at the second verse, the continuation, so we can, we can understand that more. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of God's grace? And the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, Jesus, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. So now, what thoughts uh, uh, come through this passage? And here is the condemnation or the sin that has come from one man's sin and now you look at how one man takes away the sin that was caused by one man right any any thoughts on this this talk about fallen the redemption right so look through that and any thoughts on how god has made this provision for mankind to redeem him from the sin that was caused by the disobedience of one man, Adam. And Jesus is called second Adam, right? It makes you think about the seriousness of sin and how important it is that just the fact that it exists sets us apart from God and prevents us from being holy in the way that He wants us to be. Um, so I think that contrasted with the fact that Jesus was able to cover all that with grace and pride away, despite us being so hard. Just reading how that worked and what he was able to do through that, um, it's, I think it leads into what one of the questions is here about why we struggle with mm -hmm. the fact that we can't do that for ourselves, but Jesus was the to do that. Um, so I think those kind of go hand in hand, um, reading this now. Um, yeah, I think sometimes there's a tendency in mankind to deny the fact of sin. <laughs> That's a huge deal. The first thing the passage is emphasizing on is the fact of sin. If we acknowledge that, then the rest will follow whether there's a remedy for it or not. The gift that God has made available to mankind, right? Yeah, I think sometimes we deny the uh, fact of sin uh, in the world. Uh, that's why in Romans chapter 3, we see all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned, that we including God, so everyone. If there is a righteous, whether they are known as God's people, like Jewish people, righteous people. None of them are free from this act. Everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God. So now the question is, why does humankind struggle so much with the idea that they are accountable to their creator? Yes, Kate. Um, one, I don't think anybody likes to be held accountable <laughs> to anybody. <laughs> right, that's true. And the other thought I had was, you know, sin entered the world before we were born, so we had no control over sin being in the world. Then Jesus takes away sin, and we can't have any control over the sin being taken away, and we don't like to have the lack of, we like to have control. 
so we have no control over either one. And then we're held accountable, and we don't like to be held accountable either. So the whole thing just is kind of like completely against our flesh. And so to try to convince people that, you know, because a lot of people are like, well, everybody sins. Everybody, everybody does things wrong. Everybody, you know, everybody does it, so what's the big deal if I do it? But the thing is, people don't realize that all they need to do is go to God, admit that they sin, ask for forgiveness, and give their hearts over to God. And life, although may not, the circumstances may not change, the peace that they have, the grace that they receive, the blessings that you get from God to endure the situations are are so worth it. Mm. I mean, it, and many times God blesses you in so many ways that are just worth a lot of money. I mean, if you could, <laughs> if you could buy them, right, right. but you can't buy you them, can't buy them right? because they're gifts from God. But the, they don't realize that it's so worth going to God and doing this just for that much less eternal life in heaven. And they don't seem to realize that hell is a real place. Mm. And that mm. it, they will go there if they don't go to God. And they just, it's like, they just can't see beyond this, mm. what's here today. Mm. I'm okay today, but really they're not. Mm. Just leave me alone. True, yeah. And it's like, no, you're not okay today. Life could be so much better. Mm. And eternity could be great. I even, I, when I came to the U.S. seven years ago, uh, everything is reversed here. I mean, the opposite to what we do in India. Fans rotate reverse. <laughs> you just are opposite. You drive on the opposite direction, right? <laughs> And why am I accountable to this country in that, direct, in that way? I, I should just follow the law. I didn't grow up here. And I'm not responsible for, for making that law, right? So I am from a different country. I could abide by my own law of my country. But if I'm here, I should abide by the law that is created by this country, regardless of how much I know about it regardless of whether I can be able to do it right away or not. But I'm required. Just like that God has placed humankind on earth, they are accountable to God. They have to go back whether they, are, they acknowledge it or not. Right? That's a great point, Kate. Excellent. Any other thoughts around this? I mean, in some ways, that's really at the root of a lot of sin, I think. You know, the idea of being accountable to the Creator. So. You know, you look at Adam and Eve, and the original temptation was, uh, if you eat from that tree, then you'll be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. I think much of our sin in the end comes down to, I want to do what I want to do, or I know what's best. I want to do it this way. I don't want someone else, you know, exerting claims on my life, saying what I should be doing, saying what's better. And, right, which is, I mean, that's that fundamental idea. Excellent. Can we move on? Unless somebody has some more to add to it. Now let's look at our belief on salvation, justification, and regeneration. Okay. And you have uh, more uh, Bible references in the book. Because of uh, time restriction, we are going on a short way of uh, reaching out to this. But you have plenty of references uh, in this uh, booklet and then you can go through them when you go home and uh, if you have questions you can ask uh, any team on the staff or me right so belief on salvation justification and regeneration the question here is why do you think repentance and faith are essential for salvation and how does a person acquire these two things And I think we should read this. Someone can read this passage for me. Can anyone read this thing? We believe that. 
Salvation is by grace. I can read it. Yeah, please. We believe that salvation is by grace alone. It is mm -hmm. conditioned upon repenting from sin and turning toward God by faith in Christ's work on the cross. This applies whether the sin is sexual or otherwise. When we believe the gospel and put our trust in Christ, God justifies and regenerates us. Justification is a judicial act of God whereby we are declared righteous on the basis of Christ's substitutionary punishment on the cross. Regeneration makes believers newly created in Christ Jesus. By the operation of the Holy Spirit through the word, believers are given a disposition of obedience toward God. Okay, what did you get there? In that passage and why do you think repentance and faith are essential for salvation and how we can acquire uh, those two things any thoughts well being an ex-catholic I really liked that um, justification is a judicial act of God because I pictured God God the Father is sitting on the judge's bench and mm -hmm. because it was very, we had to do a lot of um, confessions and penance and so that actually is a very good picture for me so that he's there saying not guilty, you know, and then after that, um, you know, so you come into the courtroom and you say, I'm sorry for my sins, and I want to put my trust in you. Mm. And God says, okay then, not guilty. And then it's like you get this piece of paper that says, okay, now you are a new creation, or you get a new robe or something, and you're a new creation. And from that point forward, then you have this desire to obey God. Mm. Mm. You walk out of that courtroom, and from that point on, you are a new person. Kind of like when you get married, and um, if you're a, a bride, you went from being Miss Smith to Mrs. Jones. You know, you walked into the church, you're Miss Smith. You walk out of the church, you're Mrs. Jones. You're oh. a new person. You're in a new family. You're no longer with your other family. Or new, new last name? What? New last name. New last name, <laughs> new family. Some people don't want to change the last name, right? I know. <laughs> right. And okay. some people don't even want to leave the old family. But, um, right. <laughs> but um, God right. says, you know, leave and cleave. And you want to add something? Yeah. So sort of paired along with that, you know, we have the sense it's conditioned upon repenting from sin and turning towards God. So, right, it is necessary that you turn away from your sin to believe in God. You know, if, if you don't turn from your sin at all, if you say, I believe in Jesus, and then you keep on going and doing the same things you did before, then there's no, there's not real truth to your belief hmm. in that sense. So that means or, that it, yeah. or, or taking the marriage analogy, if you leave the sanctuary with a new name, and then go on living as though you weren't married, there's obviously a problem there. Sure. So there is some action on our part too, right? Right. So, right. so you have to turn away from the old life. You have to turn away from, you know, just always doing things the way you want to do and saying, God's not going to tell me anything about how I'm going to live. Mm -hmm. Like that's tied in with believing in him. Because mm -hmm. even the devil believes in God. Right. Right. Absolutely. He shudders. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because there are people who repent, but they don't have faith. But there are they people claim? who have faith, they don't repent. Right. So these two actually go hand in hand, which are important for us to live a life of godliness. Right. So let's uh, look at sanctification and uh, glorification. Can someone read that passage, the summary? We believe that in sanctification the believer is cleansed and set apart for God, being conformed progressively to the image of Christ, and ultimately has complete victory over sin at the coming of Christ. Okay, what does it mean here? And look at uh, what uh, Paul tells in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 30. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, 
who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called those he called, he also justified those he justified, he also glorified. <coughs> So here you see God's action along with our action. It's not just like uh, we believe on Jesus and we work out our salvation. No, we, we place our faith on Jesus and we try to do whatever possible within our, our human uh, being, like you know, restraining from the things that we have been doing in the past. And now here, there is a counteraction from God to support us. Like say, yeah, he's... He has called each one of us according to the purposes, like you were saying. Even if we have different deformities and different identities within our cultural differences or within our bodily differences. But there is a purpose, so he works out good for those who place trust on him, right? Then what sanctification and glorification mean for us? Growing in Christ requires us to graciously strive to become more like Jesus and I do not know whether all of you were uh, in the church in the last one year when we spoke about gracious striving and we know 2nd Peter chapter 1 verse 3 to 11 right anybody remember that right we strive through that grace right gracious striving it's not like uh, gracious striving means it's not that we become gracious in that it is God who is gracious when we are striving <laughs> that is the way to understand sometimes we think we want to be like a little kind in striving no 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 it's not that way but gracious striving is something God is also involved in our striving against our flesh and blood to become true holy and justified in the presence of God so, and let's look at what uh, uh, I think we have in Second Peter 1 to 3 verse. The empowering of the Spirit of God enables us to walk in obedience to the Word and to turn away from any sinful habits, right? So, let's look at uh, this question. Uh, what is God's design for us to grow in Christ's likeness? What's God's, God's design for us? And also we need to think about uh, what is uh, Second Peter uh, saying from what Romans tells how that's kind of we can see both uh, paragraphs in, in context and understand God's design for us to grow in Christ's likeliness. likeness. So how do we how do we grasp that as a, as a humans chosen by God for His own purposes and then we 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 accept Him by our faith and repent of our sins and we live a godly life uh, and we strive for uh, you know becoming more holy more faithful uh, children of God. So how do we understand how we can become more like uh, Jesus Christ? You know I was in a seminary. Uh, for 10 years before coming to the States, uh, I used to tell uh, my students, Hindus and Muslims that we are surrounded by do not have Bibles to read. We are Bibles to them. I, I used to tell my students, you are a Bible to a non-believer. So he doesn't have to read the Bible. He has to see you. You know, like Gandhi just said, my life is a message. So how we can become a message? Jesus did not write a bunch of books. His disciples wrote. He would have written and left a legacy. <laughs> he did not. He doesn't have to. And everything that Jesus left a message through his life has been written in the books and the world cannot contain, right? That's what the Bible tells. So, how, 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 how we can grow more 
like Jesus Christ. I mean, I suppose there are a couple of different, I mean, reading the Bible is obviously important. Something tells us about what he's like living in Christian community is part of how that happens too. And that God has given us his spirit who lives in us, who also is sort of doing that work at the same time through and using some of those, using God's word, using Christian community to, to bring that fruit about in our lives. I like it verse five in this pat in that passage it says make every effort i tend to be a little lazy sometimes so it's a good reminder um, that god provides us all that we need but to, to go for it as well make every effort to put things in place to grow with him more right that is so key right make every effort is so key because i have seen um well, it's, I don't want to say it's just in the Western church. I always bring this perspective of Eastern church and Western church. But, you know, I have seen most of the times show up, pay up, and shut up. That is what most of the people do in the churches. Uh, they pay up the tithes, or they, you know, they show up and they pay up the tithes, and they shut up. Means they think they don't have to do anything. Just come means we have to show up. And then pay up your tithe means, you know, make sure the church survives, you know, by paying certain things. And then we have nothing to do. There are people, there is a team that will uh, tell us what to do uh, and all else they themselves will do for us. You see that kind of thing? That attitude is not just here everywhere. But there is the greater part of our, ourselves to, to be salt and light in this world along with others and the, the, the light that shines us shines in us through us should be seen by others not just we feel about it not just we feel about it right so good so that's God's design that we live in the world like Jesus Christ has lived like the master we should reflect what the master that is the key, you know, like I always tell my story, you are little, little Jesuses to the world. <laughs> you walk like Jesus. I'm not saying you dress up like Jesus or grow your hair like hippies. No, none of those things. But you just be a little Jesus Christ to them with your love, with your embracing, by showing difference and contrast with the things of the world. And they say, who is this guy? Several people ask me in India when we do certain things, they ask, why do you do these things when many people who can do these things, but they cannot do these things? Why do you do? And we say, it's because of Jesus. It's because of Jesus. Let's move on to the next. That is security and preservance. And let's read the summary. Who is going to do that? Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Okay. okay. We believe that upon salvation, we are given everlasting life that we are sealed for the day of redemption. Our life is hidden with Christ and God, for we are reborn with imperishable seed. We are given knowledge and assurance of eternal life, and are assured of suffering neither condemnation nor separation from God. We are nevertheless warned not to accept the grace of God in vain, but to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, to hold fast to the hope set before us, and to take heed, lest there be any or in anyone an evil, unbelieving heart leading one to fall away from the living God. And look at here, these are actually, uh, how many verses, almost 10 verses put together as a passage, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is not one, pa one passage, right? So you see the, the references given there. First um, sentence comes from John chapter five, verse 24. And you know, these are all put together. It's like the cream of uh, viewer security and preservance. <laughs> uh, you know, um, perseverance, right? And uh, Ephesians, let's go to Ephesians. And uh, uh, you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. Is it just hearing the truth? You are automatically becoming part of uh, Jesus Christ, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with the seed, the promised Holy Spirit who is. Uh, deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. 
look at the, the uh, believer security, how the seal of the Holy Spirit on us when we come into Jesus Christ. And this summary is great that you can, you can understand how we are born of the imperishable seed when we accept Jesus Christ. And our life is what? Hidden in Christ Jesus. Hidden in Christ. That tells about, so anything that comes against us, who has to be hit by? I mean, it, was, it is Jesus. We are hidden in him. It's like Jesus takes all our pain, our suffering, anything comes on all. It doesn't mean that we are going to have a sweet life on earth. We are not going to have a bed of roses. Uh, it doesn't uh, promises that we will be sickness free uh, because we accepted Jesus Christ. But we will not have the same feeling like others in the world go through the same problems like we go through. Like, right? For example, somebody has a cancer and he's going to die and they have no hope of what is going to happen in the future. But we have hope. We don't care whether uh, we die or we live and we know we will ultimately end up, right? Uh, with Jesus Christ. And let us look at perseverance in Hebrew chapter 6, verse 11 to 12. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end. So that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to be lazy. Sometimes we do it, like the other one was saying. But imitate, but imitate those, who, those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. You know when we baptize in India, how we do? We ask them, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Then uh, we ask, will you remain faithful till the end of your life, though it is pain, though it is divorce, though it is a persecution? We'll ask tons of questions to that. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad, who is a pastor, who he used to parade these people in the streets to give a testimony of how they have been changed. I'm not saying we should do that, but that's how he did. And believers, once they come to faith, there is no way they can go back because they are already separated publicly in front of everybody. And they make that commitment in front of everybody loud enough. So this is exactly what it is. Like We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end. That is the key. You know, sometimes what we are today doesn't mean, but there is an honor part. We need to be faithful to experience that perseverance and experience that security in Jesus Christ, right? And uh, question, since we are redeemed by grace alone, through Christ alone, must we still do good works and obey God's word? Yeah. Do we need to? Yes. <laughs> I see somebody doubting, like, really? Yeah. Really? Okay. We shall also want to if we believe all the things. But you know, but Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, it is light. The, you know, come all those who are weary. And my burden is light, you know, that's his burden. That means that is still a burden. We need to carry that, that, but it is lighter than what we carry by ourselves, the burden. Kate, you're trying to say something? I just said right. Oh, good, good, thank you. <laughs> okay, here is the answer. <laughs> yes, because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, also renews us by his spirit, so that our lives may show love and gratitude to God, so that we may be assured of our faith by the fruits, and so that by our godly behavior, others may be one, may be one to Christ. So how can a Christian safeguard his conscience in regard to security of his salvation? This is a, a simple answer, but you know, uh, it doesn't uh, come easy way. Uh, uh, we need to safeguard our conscience. How do we do it? It's by daily living, you know, taking up the cross, right? It's not easy. Sometimes 
uh, we have faith, but we don't sacrifice other things. We we believe on Jesus Christ, but God tells us to live in a particular way, a particular lifestyle. We don't like to do that. So there is a sacrifice. I always talk about faith sacrifice. These two are very important, you know, faith sacrifice and commitment. So for a Christian life, we need to have commitment to Christ, right? So we'll move on before I finish. Can I move around and share something? Yeah, 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 please. So in the very beginning, you asked us to how, um, or what application to daily life, or maybe reading the Word and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, because I think it comes back to this. I, spending time in the Word, um, if I spend time in the Word, I just convince myself, I'm in my own head. So like whatever my head is saying, and you know, I can very easily be swayed and listen to justification of sin and other things just mentally inside. But when I read the word, God, I'm listening to what God is telling me and what God is teaching me. And so when I can soak myself a bit every day in that, and really, like, that is my stronghold, that is where I come back to. Um, I mean, it encourages me and safeguards me to act and live as God would want me to live. And it also stirs that desire to do so. And, you know, so anyway, tying it back to the word and spending time in it, that's where God really, mm -hmm. can, um, yeah, I'm listening to him instead of myself, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the word is a light unto my path, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a light to your daily living, right? What else, anything, Any, anybody want to add? Amen. Yeah, let's move on to resurrection and immortality, right? Can someone read the section there? Oh, yeah. We believe that at the return of Jesus Christ, the righteous dead will be raised and the living believers will be changed so that both will have literal, spiritual, and immortal bodies like Christ's own glorious body. So now this is actually life after death, right? So there is a hope. This is talking about hope, hope right? Christian, Christian element, which is important. Hope is the key to our faith, if there is no hope, right? Resurrection, like we have uh, celebrated Easter last Sunday, and if there was no resurrection, and there was uh, no meaning to what, where Jesus lived, what Jesus taught, uh, what Jesus declared, everything is useless without resurrection, right? So now when he resurrected, that means we are part of him because our life is in him, so we resurrect. So we have that hope. That is what it is basically talking about, right? So look at the First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and our left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. What a hope. You know, I heard this uh, illustration. Uh, there was a, a, a woman who was uh, traveling in a boat. And there were storms uh, shaking the boat like that. So everybody screaming and crying. And this woman was uh, uh, like sitting there as if nothing is happening in the boat, you know, <laughs> nothing is going to happen by the storm. She was like very calm and quiet. And one guy got angry at her and asked, what's wrong with you? Why you are not scared of death? We are all going to sink. We're going to lose our life in a few minutes. And then she said, no, actually I'm um, going to meet one of my sons on the other side of the shore. I have, uh, I, I have two sons, but uh, one of my sons died and he went to heaven. And my dream is to meet one of the sons now. And if I don't meet my son on earth, I will meet other son in heaven. Mm -hmm. It's her hope, you know, so I don't have to be afraid of uh, death anymore because I know my security in Jesus. So I'm going to meet my other son in heaven uh, if I'm not meeting my son on the other side of the shore. You see the assurance. So sometimes 
this, the calmness of spirit that comes to you when you go through life-threatening problems, that is because there is assurance. I used to be a, uh, a prayer minister at Asbury Seminary, and I used to call on every Thursday to the alumni of Asbury Seminary, who are bishops, who are professors, or doctors, or whatever. I used to call them and ask them how I can be praying for them. And uh, because I had cancer in 2004, uh, I used my experience of how I trusted God for healing. And uh, I just say, yeah, if God can do something for me, and there is a hope for you as well. And uh, so I called that uh, uh, person, it was a lady, and I asked her how we can be praying for you. And then she said, oh, let's pray for the salvation of uh, people in Haiti. Let's pray for the salvation of this country. That's what she said. I said, no, I'm calling to ask you how we can be praying for you, your family, your ministry. And she said, no, oh, uh, I, I don't worry about it. But, but at the end, she told her husband was in hospital at that time, a hospital fighting cancer. She has breast cancer. Her son had another cancer. But all of them had so you don't want prayers for it? Oh, of course we need it. But you know what? These sicknesses don't even threaten us a bit. We don't care because this is temporary body. I, like, I was enriched by her statement because look at how she feels of security in Christ. Do we have that? That's a hope you need. If you don't have hope, that means you're wasting your time. <laughs> Literally, that is the way it is. Like, if we don't have that confidence and hope that we are going to be with Christ in, 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 in future, after death, and sometimes we are doing certain things mechanically. So that is the joy that we generate. Right? And here is the question Christians have been promised that they will struggle against opposing forces as they live out the gospel. How should this doctrine impact Fear and doubt. Right? So how, how, how does this impact fear and doubt in us? What is this doctrine they're talking about? The doctrine of hope. And, you know, we have this fear, even us. I went through persecution in India, uh, went through lots of uh, uh, pain and suffering for the sake of preaching the gospel, right? And, but still, it doesn't mean that I'm free from fear, right? I still have that um, fear. But when I think of this hope uh, that this is temporary, but there is something, eternity, that's waiting for me, I don't know that fear, the doubt, struggles, they just slowly disappear. I, I will not even notice when that is gone. I will just feel the bubbly of joy, you know, the, that kind of thing. So, how do... What is your experience? Any anything that you want to add to it? You we will struggle against all these things, right? These forces as we live out. But how do we? So when we struggle, what what comes to our mind? Fear and doubt, right? When we struggle, is there a God? I did that. I questioned that. Is there God? That's the main question that comes. Really, if there is a God, why? You know, kind of thing. But when you hit rock bottom then you still have to answer, if there isn't a God, then what? Or if God is not good, then what? Or if I'm going to turn away from God, then what? And the then what is not a, it's not a good option. Right. So no matter how hard it is to stay faithful to God because he isn't answering your prayer the way you want him to, or your situation isn't changing and it's very difficult, you still need to keep going. You realize that you still need to keep going to God. And yeah. he does show his faithfulness. It's just, we're not always agreeing to his timing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Any other thoughts? Reminding yourself that you're on the winning team, even if there's opposing <laughs> viewpoints or attack, if it's physical attacks like persecution or that kind of thing, or if it's just like 
people calling you out, so that you know it's true, but they think it's wrong. Mm. Knowing that in the end, you're ultimately God is more powerful than that, and you're going to end up having eternal life. Realizing the importance of that should kind of trump everything else. Hmm. Which is hard to do sometimes. But. Yeah. You know, in the country I come from, to live the life of gospel is so hard. When my dad accepted Jesus, he has to be thrown out from his village, thrown out from his own family. And he has to lose the inheritance from his parents. That's the price. Will we stay faithful to God when our job is gone? Will we keep our commitments? When God takes everything, chips away everything from our life one by one? Maybe that's a test. Not that he's leading you through the uh, problems of uh, fear and doubt or struggles of life that he has no other job to do, but he's doing it with a purpose, right? He, he took me through so many milestones of my life where I felt I'm all alone and God was not with me. But only after passing by that milestone, I look back and I see my footprints are not there because God carried it through me. The ones I see there, they're not mine, but they are Jesus's. That is the hope that we have. All I can say is, remain faithful. Remain faithful. So that is the lesson for uh, today. If you have any questions, you can ask us. Otherwise, I could say thank you for coming to HP 101.